Shavu the Shalom the Basisam. Right? They come. They came back safely and in peace to their homes. So this is what we do. We go out and we kill and destroy as much as we can, so that we can come home and be safe within our borders. This is the psychology. This, if you can call it that, is the strategy, which is no strategy at all. And where it will end is the destruction of Israel. So welcome all. Um, my name is Doug Thorpe, and I'm, I'm going to be um, moderating uh, this discussion with Mark Braverman and Jonathan Katab. And um, I am here really on behalf of the Stones Cry Out delegation. We are welcoming Mark Braverman and Jonathan Katab to finish this series of webinars. There's lots of different places we can start, but but um, obviously in the news right now is the fact that um, Israel uh, somehow managed to um, um, get its hands on these pagers um, that Hezbollah was using in Lebanon, um, and there have been a, a series of attacks. Um, I don't know. Do either of you um, want to uh, comment on on uh, this latest uh, escalation? Um, yeah. And Mark, you're, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this, and uh, I have an, a number of uh, reactions. Number one, it's a reminder to us, uh, and I think it was intended to be a reminder, that Israel is powerful, does have very high technological capabilities, can and does meet out uh, punishment and violence whenever and wherever it chooses, that it's also a creative uh, entity that can come up with new things that nobody ever thought about before, that, that it is totally oblivious to uh, rules, regulations, international law, and doesn't even care what are the ultimate consequences of its actions in the long run in terms of relations with either the Arab world or the rest of the world. Uh, it has bought into the logic of power and force and blood and iron, and uh, it is our will and we can and will uh, impose it as we wish, when we wish, uh, that's it. Uh, this is really scary, I think, uh, not just for the rest of the world or for Palestinians or Arabs or Lebanese, whatever, but it's also scary for Israelis and for Jewish people, particularly in Israel, uh, to actually choose uh, a path of, we, we've decided we want to live by the sword, uh, because ultimately that means they will die by the sword. It sort of breaks the the, the hope, the, the the aspiration that many people have that maybe, maybe somehow we yeah. will come to, to 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 peace. Maybe somehow we will learn to live together. Maybe somehow uh, justice and reconciliation uh, will prevail. They're saying, no, we 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 choose this path. And it's going to be our way or, or or nothing else. And we're powerful enough to do it. And the world is allowing us. And the United States is permitting us. And international, uh, they don't mean anything to us. Yeah, that, that's such a uh, dangerous and scary thing. Uh, the, 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 that was my reaction. You know, look at us. We we can do it. We, 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 we will do things you can't even imagine. Yes. Uh, because we can. Yeah, Mark, you want to add anything? Yeah. <clears throat> so, Jonathan, I, I share your, your feeling of uh, being, that it, this is scary. <clears throat> it's scary on so many levels. I, I don't think I can be here with all of you today, and it's wonderful to see so many friends and, and to be with you. But I don't think I can be here unless I, I share the feeling that I have this morning. I was having tea with, with my wife, and uh, we've been talking about the news, and 
the, the, there's been a second wave of explosions and uh, yeah. um, besides the horror that I feel about what is happening, I am heartbroken. <laughs> I, I'm just heartbroken because Susan said to me, what, my wife said to me, what, what, what? no, I said to her, I said, where do they expect this to end? Where does Israel expect this to end? Or maybe she said that to me, and I said, they have no idea. They're out of control. They're doing what they can, to Jonathan's point. They're doing it because they can do it. And um, and because the, the, the only comfortable place to be for Israel, and this is the end, the end result of the whole Zionist project, is war. Us against them. And, you know, Gallant said this the other day. He said, our goal here, I mean, Netanyahu is saying, we have to destroy Hamas. War. We have to destroy them. Full stop. Gallant is saying, our goal now is turning to the north so that we can bring our people home, the ones that have been displaced. I have to tell you that if you... First time I went to Israel, I was a kid. I was 18, 19 years old. And on Israeli radio, in Hebrew, Jonathan, you, you, you'll you resonate with this. Um, uh, they would send out sorties of fighter jets because they love their fighter jets. And then the end would be, Shavu le Shalom le Basisam. Right? They, come ba they came back safely and in peace to their homes. So this is what we do. We go out and we kill and destroy as much as we can so that we can come home and be safe within our borders. This is the psychology. This, if you can call it that, is the strategy, which is no strategy at all. And where it will end is the destruction of Israel in one way or another. There is no plan beyond that. And so this breaks my heart. <laughs> I mean, I'm watching the genocide of your people, Jonathan, and my heart at the same time is breaking for my people because they are destroying themselves in the process. I, what, what I would like to talk about us to talk about today, and I shared this with Doug um, and, and with you before, is because given who yeah, you are, you are Fasna, I, I, you lead Fasna, I lead Kairos USA. Our work, who, who we serve, is the churches of the United States as part of a global network of churches in support of Palestine. Where does, what is this moment now for us as the, the, this network of American churches? Where do the churches step up, given that this is now the reality? And the reality, of course, is that Israel, in its, in its criminal, genocidal, and self-destructive course, it's being absolutely 100%, I don't care if you're talking about Harris or if you're talking about Biden or Trump, is fully participating and enabling this to happen. So where does that leave the church? <clears throat> and you want Jonathan to respond to that? And of course, yeah. Fahd and Shabil's church-based group. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the situation of the church is really, really curious to me because, uh, I mean, we we've seen uh, we, we we've had this uh, conversation before. Munder Ishaq, when he came here, was talking about the silence and the complicity of the church. And uh, what we talk about Israel's uh, feeling of impunity is fueled directly, not mm -hmm. only by U.S. complicity, but by the silence of the church. The church somehow uh, has found a way uh, to ignore what it sees in front of its eyes. I mean, when the Holocaust took place uh, in Germany, it was mostly in the dark. People even in Germany could claim rightly or wrongly that we, we didn't really know. We didn't see it happening. It was only after the war that the horror of it 
struck us and we are now uh, horrified uh, that, that we didn't do enough. Here, there is no excuse. You see it every single day on your uh, TV screens, in your social media, despite every effort to to hide it, to spin it, to justify it. The horror of it is right in front of our eyes. How can the church be silent? My brother uh, Samuel with some uh, Palestinian, Muslim, and Jewish friends in Philadelphia started something called Prayers for Peace, where they would just stand outside churches with placards, no flags, no... Uh, just placard saying, pray for the children of Gaza. Pray for a ceasefire. Nothing more than that. And they have been getting pushback from churches. You know, <laughs> get off our property. We don't want to get involved. Uh, you know, this is private property. Well, some other churches invited them in and prayed with them. But the number of churches that simply do not want to touch this that are yeah. really beyond complicit. Uh, th their silence is, is to me, uh, I, I cannot understand it. Uh, I, I think the Palestinian people are going to survive somehow. Uh, but, but the question is, can the church's ethics and morality survive? Uh, how will Judaism and Jews survive? How will international law survive? Uh, how will any sense of uh, a unified human international response uh, survive? And of course, as a Christian, I say, you know, how will the churches survive? Where are God's people in this uh, situation? And I'm not sure I have an answer. Do you want to add anything, Mark? I mean, you can certainly <laughs> talk about where we just were yesterday in terms of the gathering of clergy here in the Northwest. I think, Jonathan, you're asking exactly the right question. How do we understand this? I have I have a thought about that. Um, it, it's the concept of church struggle. So this is the same question that Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the Confessing Church faced in the 1930s in Germany. How does how can the church actively participate in the Nazi program because that's what was happening with with, with yeah, both the that's and, true yeah and, and and they did what they did and in fact <laughs> Bonhoeffer after they after the Nazis closed down the confessing church he joined the plot to assassinate the head of state and to bring it down okay yeah. the South Africans uh, starting in the 60s black and white pastors, some got kicked out of their own churches, and some of them got banned from the country because they stood up <laughs> against apartheid. And in their 1985 document, they called for the downfall of the regime. The churches, church people, called for the downfall of the regime. In in our country here, starting in 1950s, in the basement of a church in Montgomery. Pastors, black pastors, began a, a, a began basically their own BDS movement, their own boy boycott movement, and that spread and eventually took over the whole country. But these are all yeah. examples of what Bonhoeffer and Karl Barth called church struggle. And in fact, Bonhoeffer said. The only living church, the the real church, rather than the false church, is a struggling church. That's the living church. So it's not a church. Mm -hmm. and think about the early church. That was yeah. a struggle. That was a struggle yeah. between God and Torah and the Roman Empire. Right? Mm -hmm. so this is the church. <clears throat> if you go back, for example, to bring it up to the present day with the current church struggle, which is about Palestine, in 2004, the Presbyterians, not knowing what the hell they were doing, in 2004, this is before BDS was officially a movement from the Palestine, from the Palestinians, uh, passed a resolution to divest their funds from um, half a dozen companies that were involved in the right. occupation. Yeah. 
They said, well, somebody said, you, according to our according to our rules, we cannot be invested in this, that, and the other company because they are involved in anti in, in human rights violations and in anti Christian activities, basically. Yeah. At which point, the next day, the headlines screamed, Presbyterians boycott Israel, and they ran into this buzzsaw, and they backed up as quickly as they could. But from 2004 until 2014, when they finally, passed, by a hair, passed the investment resolution, that church was struggling with how to take a stand. Just about divestment, not talking about apartheid, genocide, just about divestment. And all the other major churches and the peace churches in the United States have fallen in line and have done the same thing over the past 20 years. So I think, Jonathan, we have to, we can talk about the silence and complicity of the churches, but we also have to recognize that the churches here have been actively involved in a struggle about this for 20 years. And my question is, how do we bring that struggle to a head now when what we are facing is not just the genocide of the Palestinian, mm -hmm. uh, genocidal campaign against the Palestinian people, but a country that claims to represent Torah and the Jewish people and religion and, and Christianity, for that matter, if we talk about Christian Zionism, which is going to bring the whole world down around our ears. You know, what is this moment for the churches? That, I think, is the question that we have to yeah yeah there's a note in the in the chat that says in 1992 there was a kairos usa movement to address the 500th anniversary of columbus's arrival discuss the question of empire seems to me that these kairos usa movements are both rooted in opposition to empire and settler colonialism very good perfect yeah exactly that's why this is a global struggle I, I I didn't want to imply that there wasn't action by the churches. There has been action and there have been people in the churches. And it's mostly, uh, uh, we are missing something. We're yeah. getting some statements from uh, the churches at the top. Uh, but young people, I think, have, have, have taken up, uh, I think about the Mennonite churches, for example. Mm -hmm. The Mennonites generally are very quiet people. They're, they're peaceful <laughs> people. They don't like to get involved in politics. But all of a sudden, young people started something called Mennonite action. Grassroots, totally uh, led by young people that, that were doing amazing things. I mean, one of their activities was uh, to, to, uh, <clears throat> to hold sit-ins at 40 different uh, representatives at the same time. And it says, bring your hymn books along. They <laughs> went to a demonstration with their hymn books and started singing hymns uh, outside these different uh, representatives' uh, yeah. offices. Uh, I, I think there is some movement in the churches, but but certainly not, not enough. And, and, and part of the problem, I think, is Christian Zionism. Uh, part of the problem is perhaps uh, guilt feelings over their previous silence uh, on the Jewish Holocaust in, in Germany. So now they want to make up for it by being silent about Israel's actions today. Uh, part of it, I think, is also that they are caught up in empire. They are caught up in uh, being part of the structure uh, they, 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 they think this is uh, their time and this is their country and this is their uh, power uh, and they don't want that to be diluted. Uh, they don't want to uh, participate in uh, struggles like the Palestinian struggle, which uh, they, they think is too uh, disruptive of their own power uh, base. Yeah, there was uh, somebody, uh, when, when Mark and I were meeting with local clergy yesterday, uh, somebody summed up their issue um, pretty simply, saying it's 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 a prophetic message versus a pragmatic message, meaning that if you are prophetic, you're going to lose, you know, your $10,000 donation. <clears throat> I mean, they were, they were honest um, uh, uh, about the, the struggle that they're having. 
Um, and it's also, you know, the the there's it's interesting what you're saying, Jonathan, about the 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 youth movement and and how do we find ways to connect into that. Um, you know, I'm I'm on the, the the bishops committee here in the Episcopal uh, uh, diocese in Western Washington. Uh, one of my former students, Sarah Reeves, who was instrumental in helping us get to Washington in March, she joined that committee for about two months. And I'm just being perfectly honest, you know, she she then resigned from it in order to work with um, Christians for a ceasefire, right? I mean, she wanted she wanted a, an activist group, right? And I think that example is probably pretty typical of what we're seeing. So, you know, a, a related issue is we've got, you know, how many different organizations, including church organizations? I mean, there's FOSNA, Kairos, there's all the pin groups, um, uh, there's CPAP, there's CMAP. Um, we've got all these groups, right? And at, at the best, they, 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 they come together, which is what's happened with the Stones Cry Out. FOSNA and, and Jesse, the staff person, have been wonderfully supportive. CMEP has been supportive and so on, right? Um, so we do come together, but we are also, to a certain extent, in silos. Um, is this a problem and is there a way to resolve it? Or, or is it simply that, that we do have different organizations and we find ways to work together? <laughs> good question. Good, good, good question. I, I, jumped, I, uh, I stumped Jonathan. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, several people talked about why why isn't there a single Christian voice for Palestine? You have uh, JVP, you have American Muslims for Palestine, right. but there is no single. Christian uh, umbrella that that has all these different groups, uh, and uh, I don't know. You know, maybe may, maybe maybe there is need for more uh, cooperation. But but I'm also bothered that many times our activities are uh, within our own framework. Uh, mm -hmm. We invite each other to our events and we right. all come and, and attend these events, yes. but there isn't enough outreach to others. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I go on a speaking tour, I always ask, please, please, please uh, and invite or arrange for me to meet with some evangelical churches, some uh, synagogues, mainline Jewish groups, not just uh, JVP. Yeah. Uh, I I I hate you know preaching to the choir all the time, even though uh, Alex Oud, my cousin, says even the choir needs some preaching sometimes. You have to... <laughs> but 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 we really need to find ways to break out of uh, our our uh, mm. small groups and to reach out, uh, uh, including to people who totally do disagree with us. Uh, I find, for example. Uh, maybe because I grew up in evangelical circles. I find that evangelicals are most open to our message if we use biblical language and quote biblical texts instead of mm -hmm. using secular arguments of international law and human rights and uh, uh, and and, and the, the fear of a third world war, which, I mean, bring on Armageddon, they tell you. Yeah, but But if you quote scripture to them, uh, they are very open. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, their support for uh, Zionism in Israel is really, uh, even though it's very wide, it's very skin deep. It's mm -hmm. not very deep. Uh, and But you have to quote scripture to them. You cannot just go to them with uh, secular arguments. Yeah. Uh, and and, and they, are, they are good people and they are decent people and they can be reached. Uh, similarly, uh, people in the Jewish community, they, they are, and I mean mainline people in the mainline Jewish community, they feel the crisis. They are in a dilemma. Uh, they feel the trauma and they, they, they do not like what is happening. Uh, yeah. Their the, uh, presumed automatic support for the government of Israel uh, is, 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 not, is not real because 
there is a lot of uh, trauma, there is a lot of uh, friction, and there's a lot of uh, moral hand wringing. And 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 if they if they are approached correctly, I think they can be uh, they can be reached with 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 a good message, with a positive message uh, that 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 we have. Right. Yeah. So there's both the fact that we have all these different organizations, and and unlike JVP or you know they're 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 all different, but we're all kind of talking to each other in the different organizations. And and so we're you know we're not getting outside the box sufficiently. Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything, right? Um, I mean, Kairos, you know, Kairos has its own position, its own importance. Um, uh, we've been focusing. <clears throat> Kairos is operating sort of on two levels. One is we're we're deeply involved in working with global Kairos for justice. Um, with the folks in, in, as part of a, a global network. And I think it's really, really important for the American Christians to understand that they are linked uh, in a fabric of global mutuality. Mm -hmm. um, churches all over the world that are actively involved um, in the struggle, especially the power of the global South, um, which speaks in the same voice theologically as the Palestinians, who really we have to consider as being part of, of the global South. It's a different theology and a different way of thinking about the church than the North, which is, uh, I mean, the churches in the North are intimately tied up with the Western world and uh, as such have a, a legacy of colonialism and whiteness, capital W. And I think we do struggle with this. Um, the American churches, uh, like the American government, and like a great portion of the American people, are very invested in what Israel represents, which is colonialism, which is whiteness, um, which is um, that kind of economic and, and political power, which is destroying the world. So, um, to some extent, uh, I think our salvation and what we have to look to is the voice of the victim, is the voice of the colonizer and the, uh, the co previously colonized world. Mm -hmm. And to understand that what we're seeing now is absolutely in a direct line from the doctrine of discovery from the, the, you know, from the 15th century. Right. Um, so that's one area where Kairos, is, is, uh, USA is working. We see ourselves as part of the, 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 the global network, much as FASNA, of course, is completely connected and interlocked with, with Jerusalem. Um, the second is working with the grassroots. Doug, you mentioned that uh, just the other day we were uh, sitting at the cathedral in Seattle uh, uh, talking to a group of local pastors and priests uh, from Episcopal Church and other churches and um, finding a way to reach them, that leadership, the clergy here, and Mike, maybe this is time for you to post the, uh, to put in the chat the link to the declaration that we will be officially presenting next week in Washington. I encourage you all to read that, whether you're clergy or not, get it to your clergy and get it to other people who can get it to their clergy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the signing up of this has been, has been brisk among clergy who read it and, and see it as their voice. We have to reach them. And um, that I think, you know, Jonathan and I have been talking about this for a while. How do we, how do we penetrate and create connections at the local levels with, with churches in this country? And of course, working through the, the PINs, the Palestine Israel networks of the, of the various denominations. Um, I think that if we want to talk about how the churches can be in coalition, we absolutely need to be in coalition with all the groups in this country that are working for mm -hmm. um, for this country to be its best self and to live up to um, what it claimed anyway to be its foundational principles of, de of democracy rather than aristocracy and, and, and uh, kleptography. I I've wondered if... And perhaps this is a crazy idea, but we've got all these different church-based 
uh, organizations working on this, would it make any sense to um, uh, have representatives, one or two people from each of those groups, in turn, you know, um, meet together almost like a Congress or something, you know, so that we're sharing information and, and connected together. Is that theoretically, is that a possibility? Or is that just one more layer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to imagine what you might be talking about. I mean, I know that, that for example, FASNA has been very focused on, um, on working closely with Black Lives Matter and with and, and with the Black community, so mm -hmm. one pathway to that is the Black churches. And I, I know my, my colleague Don Williams is here with us today, um, who may who will be joining us in Washington. Um, but it's 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 also directly to 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 the streets and directly to the grassroots uh, work that's yeah. being done with Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. with um, American Muslims for Palestine. Palestine is a stepping stone and a pathway to make those connections. I don't know if we're going to create another national organization, Doug. I think it has to be done <laughs> at the local level. Yeah. And the problem with our country is it's so damn big. Also true. Yeah. We have to, we have to do that. And I know uh, maybe Jonathan, you can say something about the the work that you've been doing in Fosna in establishing those uh, those connections at the local levels with local chapters. Yeah, and, and Jonathan, yeah, not just that, but just share a little bit about about where where since you know what what Fosna is working on, and and just yeah, kind of um, the energy there, and and where do yeah where do people want to be putting putting the, the their focus? Well, uh, Fosna. Uh, does have uh, like chapters in different places and some of them are more active than others. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them, uh, I mean, uh, uh, some of them are just starting and getting revitalized. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and our work with the pins, we have a uh, monthly meeting of pins uh, uh, Palestine Israel Network, uh, which are of course denominational. Each of them works within a certain denomination. Mm -hmm. So we 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 hope that the the pins meeting monthly meeting sort of becomes an an umbrella that brings other people together. Uh, but but as as Mark said, it's a huge country. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Uh, and there is so much that's happening, and there's so much that's happening within each denomination. For example, the Lutherans who are not part of the of the pins, uh, I, I found out have their own uh, activist uh, group with with as many as twenty four people full time working on activism in the for the Lutheran Church, who are wonderful and doing great gr great work. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, there is a problem of of of, of organization, uh, uh, the, but there is also the feeling in this country that uh, somehow the mainstream media continues to be very powerful mm -hmm. uh, and and to define uh, issues. Uh, and and everything else seems to be just small uh, attempts to work around the edges. Uh, somehow, we need to penetrate our message needs to reach uh, the the mainstream media as well as the mainstream church media. Uh, until very recently, literally until about a month ago, Christianity Today was was like. Uh, <laughs> mainstream uh, traditional establishment thinking on Israel Palestine uh, if if we can't reach christianity today to change its to tone what what hope do we have of really changing uh the the conversation in the united states we uh, somehow i think we are very close uh, to reaching that point Mm -hmm. There is a lot of potential support. Uh, we are not as few and as isolated as 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 it feels like we are. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but somehow 
we, we need to reach that tipping point where it suddenly becomes uh, mainstream uh, and where the church begins to speak with a strong voice. Uh, so far, it hasn't happened, mm -hmm. uh, despite official church statements, which seem to be pretty good. Uh, but it hasn't really penetrated. It mm -hmm. hasn't really broken through. Uh, and and uh, I don't know what it takes to do it, but it, it it needs to be done, and I think it will happen. Yeah, I think you know. I think Jonathan, if um, and you and I may actually meet next week, which would be great. Um, I think I think we have to put our heads together with the pins, um, and with the, all of the local leaders that we are now connected with, um, to really. To, to really focus our energy on reaching local clergy and in working with congregations. Because um, the media, like the politicians, are going to respond to the wet finger. Yeah? Which way is the political wind blowing? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think, for example, that the United States government is going to change its policies toward Israel until the political calculus changes for them. Yes. Right? And this was true for South Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yes, there was, a, there was the ANC, and there was powerful, powerful pressure from within. But I don't think that the Thatcher and the Reagan governments would have joined the sanctions, which finally brought the government down, if the Berlin Wall had not come down, and mm -hmm. the Cold War did not, quote, end. That mm -hmm. changed the political calculus for the united states they didn't have to protect south africa as a bulwark against communism anymore and ian paisley and jerry adams did not decide that they loved each other and throw down their arms in, in, in northern ireland until the political calculus changed for them and they realized it made more sense for them to work mm. together it stopped fighting so i mean obviously if the united states tomorrow said no more money and no more airplanes stop what you're doing, that would change the political calculus <laughs> for what's left of, of Israel. Yeah. But how do we change the political calculus in the United States? Mm -hmm. I, I think we just, <clears throat> you know, my, my vision is that there's enough pressure from the grassroots and the churches so that someday, within, for the next administration, I don't care who they are in Washington, the heads of every single major, every single church in the United States turns up in Washington, sits down, in the Oval Office or the Halls of Congress and says, we are not with you. We are not with you on this. Mm -hmm. Jews, Christians, together, and Muslims. Yeah. Jews and Christians saying, no more. Now, I think the Christians and the churches have to take the lead because, and I've been saying this for years, you've all heard me say this a million times like a broken record. If you Christians wait for the Jewish establishment and the Jewish community to link hands with you and join with you, you will wait too long. We will be the last. And we are just not that powerful, except in the current climate here in the United States. The Jews, 2% of the population, are more powerful than all the Christians in our Christian nation. What the hell is that about? I'll tell you what I think it's about. I think <laughs> that, it's, that, that Christians, mainline Christians, mainstream Christianity in this country, Wants, want the Jews to be in power because that reinforces Christian exceptionalism. If mm -hmm. we cut loose the Jews, right, which is sort of, if we cut loose the Jews, speak, if I were speaking as a Christian, we've somehow lost our claim to exceptionalism. Interesting. And we know what mm -hmm. Jesus would say about that. He would say, this is what I was telling you. <laughs> no more temple. It has to be something new. <laughs> and then Paul came along and the church came along and they twisted it all up into pieces and said, yeah. no, 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 we're in charge. Yeah. Really? You know, it's not too late, Mark, for seminary. And, you know. Get, to the, get into the seminaries. That's the other piece. Yeah. That's yeah. the other piece. That's where we should be focusing. That's the grassroots. That's young people. And the congregations and all the young pastors out there and some of the prophetic older ones as well, yeah. they are ready to speak with a voice. Yeah. We well, have to reach them. That's yeah. our Maybe I should mention two yeah. initiatives uh, by Fosna. 
One of them is Preach Palestine. We urge mm -hmm. everybody this uh, this stuff. year, as we did last year, to say something, preach something, make a sermon, uh, have some uh, prayers uh, during the Christmas season uh, to preach Palestine. And the second is we do have a uh, clergy and seminarians initiative, which we are trying to yeah. revive uh to try and speak to seminaries so if you have any seminary which will invite somebody from uh fasna or which will invite uh mark waverman or myself or uh some other uh speakers on this issue please let us know we are open we think well i agree with mark this is definitely part of the work that we need to do yeah yeah. There's a question from um, our friend uh, uh, Joyce Penfield. Um, my question is, what is the best use of organizing in time now capitalized since Israel is moving so fast in destruction? If they will use arms to flatten Gaza, kill 42,000, 100,000 estimated starvation, plague, etc. Is there anything they won't turn to in the West Bank as fast as they can? How do we prioritize activities? It's a good place to go as we're getting close to the end here. How do we prioritize activities? What do we need to be doing right now? And I'll put another plug in, of course. We got a delegation going to DC next week and um, you know, just trying to talk to people. But yeah, Jonathan, you wanna start off there? Uh <laughs> there is so much to do. Uh, the question yeah. of prioritizing is always something that 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 uh, bothers me because I I think there is just so much uh, to do. Yeah. Uh, in in terms of the urgency of 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 the hour, I always think about the ceasefire as you know, just get your knee off my neck. It's an immediate thing. You you need to stop. Right and uh, ending the siege of Gaza, allowing food in is again. I can't breathe. Let me breathe. These are immediate existential needs that have to be met <clears throat> before we even begin talking about apartheid and racism and uh, mm -hmm. a just solution and uh, all the other issues. Uh, it, it, it seems. I hate to say this, uh, but but there is a sense in which the other side is feeling that a change is coming. Mm -hmm. And so they have a full court press. They think this is our chance. Yeah. If we don't do it now, we won't be able to do it later. The world is awakening. They yeah. will put a stop to it. So now we, uh, we, we certainly sense this in the West Bank. You know, the settlers are running amok. Yeah. Because they really don't think they're going to be allowed to do this for long. So they're going to try to do everything they can right now. The push for a war against Iran or against the Northern Front, again, is almost a sign of desperation. We now have the power. Let's yeah. do it now. We will not always have the power. We will not always have the green light uh, from the United States. We will not always have uh, impunity under international law. Uh, this is our time. W let's do it. Uh, so, uh, yes, we, 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 we do need to work immediately. And of course, the immediate task is a ceasefire. There really needs to be a ceasefire. Once there is a ceasefire, then we can start talking about how do we achieve uh, uh, a just peace? How do we start talking with Hamas and Hezbollah and end this stupid taboo against talking to them? Yeah. Uh, how do we move towards justice rather than just maintaining the status quo? Mm -hmm. the, the issue is not to return to the way things were before October 7, because they were horrible before October 7. Uh, the issue is how do we do something totally new and different yeah, but in the meanwhile, as you say, there is a there is a genocide taking place. Yeah. Your knee is on my neck. 
I, I, I can't breathe. I'm being suffocated. Yeah, so telling me what the priorities are, I think the priorities are uh, the immediacy of, of putting an end to this madness. One thing that we talk about in the declaration, which I've you now posted several times, I wasn't sure I was successful the first time in the chat, um, is um, the message that uh, the question is, what happens after a, quote, ceasefire? In some sense, of course, there needs to be immediate relief to the people who are being um, annihilated, eliminated. That's the plan in Gaza. And it's begun in the West Bank now in earnest. And so that's also a death machine. The, the West Bank is turning into a death machine as well. But for Israel, as Israel, there is no ceasefire. There is no end to war. There is no end to the psychology that we must do it to you because you want to kill us. So there is no talking to in Israel in that sense. Um, that has to, the whole Zionist project, uh, which is now the state of Israel, has to come to an end as being not only immoral and illegal, but unsustainable for the sake of everybody between the river and the sea. So that, I think, is the message that we need to give to the United States. Some people, uh, when we were with the declaration, they said, why aren't you talking about genocide and ethnic cleansing, etc.?" I said, those words are in there. But the main message is speaking in the currency of, of, of Washington, which is, what is our national interest? And our national interest is to put a stop to that, because we are as isolated as Israel is in the world. And we are sowing the seeds of our own destruction by supporting, by supporting this. So that's the voice that the church must speak in as, as well, that we, we reject the idea of Jewish hegemony in the Holy Land, that that cannot work. Um, I, I think that that needs to be the message, which is in some ways I have, in some sense, a knee-jerk response to the focus on ceasefire, ceasefire, ceasefire. Of course, the bombing has to stop. But, you know, in a lower, in a smaller scale, Israel has bombed and destroyed Gaza several times over the course of the last 15 years, as well as the slow starvation of the siege. So it's never stopped. There has always been ish, ish, right? Fire fire um, uh, directed at the at the enemy that quote wants to destroy us i was brought up on this so right. we have to change the orientation of our of our government toward israel period that's not where it's at i mean you listen to what harris said in her acceptance speech still talking about the two-state solution my god right Still talking about the two-state solution. Uh, I, I don't know how we stop that, but I think that ha that has to be the focus. Israel will not stop. Israel will not stop. Yeah. We have to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, either of you have a sense of of within Israel? Obviously, there are protests, you know, but the protests focus on. And I can see Jonathan shaking his head, right? And and are there young is, Israeli Jews? Um, is there is there anything happening over there? Jonathan's probably more in touch with them than I. Yeah, am. yeah. I think a lot is happening in Israel, and uh, most of it is not good. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a greater consensus now on the Jewishness of the state and on Jewish supremacy. Yeah. There is a uh, less and less talk about peace or reconciliation uh, or any uh, uh, dealing with uh, Palestinians other than through power and destruction and, and, and complete domination. But there is also a, uh, strangely enough, uh, a real fear about the long-term future. I think uh, mm -hmm. 
many, I don't know if it's most Israelis, are wondering whether Israel is going to survive to its 100th birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's a general feeling among many of them. Many of them even talk about uh, the, the curse of 80, that they won't arrive at 80 years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so there, is, there is a crisis. There, there is a feeling that we are in crisis. Yeah, but that does not translate into, therefore, let us seek peace. Therefore, let us talk to Palestinians. Therefore, let us think of other uh, solutions other than uh, military uh, power. Uh, there are a lot of people who are leaving, uh, leaving with no thought of returning. Yeah. Uh, I, I've heard figures of about as many as 700,000 people have left, and half of them are saying, that's it. We're not coming back, yep. We're yeah. not coming back. Yep. Uh, and, and, and these are also, many of them are uh, among the most educated and the most liberal and the most uh, uh, open uh, people. Uh, yeah. So, so they, ha they have a problem. They have a crisis also. And, yeah. and, and every time I think about the situation, I also think about how Israeli Jews are dealing with it. Uh, but but for many of them, they they have bought into the the logic of, of power and 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 force and violence as being the only way forward. Uh, they have lost a lot of faith in the possibility of uh, peace with the Palestinians. The, the 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 trauma, the shock of October seven. Instead of saying we've been doing things wrong, it has been turned into we will double down. Yeah. We will not be nice anymore. Uh, we, we, will, we will show them, we will totally crush them. Yes, and this is the only direction that Israel can go, given what, what Israel is. More and more, the mask mm -hmm. is off. We are a white supremacist Jewish state. Um, this is what we need to do, and we are at war with anyone who disagrees with that. There is an enormous brain drain. Lots and lots of Jews are leaving. They're, they're coming to New York. They're coming to Berlin. They're going to wherever they can. It's the fastest yeah. growing Jewish community in the world is Berlin, Germany. Right? Yeah. How's that for irony? Um, and you know, I write about this in one chapter of, in Wall in Jerusalem. Uh, Jewish voices within Israel, they have one message and one message only, which is that we cannot do anything from within. We are looking to you from outside, to mm. please save us, which means bring down this country because <laughs> we do not want to bring our children up in this country. We're out of here. Save yeah. our country by bringing us down. It's the same message that the South Africans gave yeah. in the 80s. Bring us down. Yeah. And this, this is the prophetic voice that the church has to articulate now. No more make peace. No more reconciliation. No more bring the sides together. Tell us, that's over. We must bring this down. Like we brought down, like the greatest generation here brought down Nazi Germany. Like um, we boycotted South Africa, isolated them internationally, so the government had to come to the table. The government had to fail. That's the game now. And that's the only voice. I mean, I'm making a categorical statement. This has to be the voices of the churches. Yeah, we're right at the uh, right at the hour, um, and, and uh, maybe you've both given final statements, but I want to offer that to both of you. And um, and I just want to say uh, once again, thank you to both Jonathan and Mark. I mean, I love the fact that we're ending this series of webinars with the two of you. Uh, Jonathan made his way from Palestine and the whole history that that you carry um, as a Palestinian. Mark, um, uh, my memory is that your your grandfather was a fifth generation Palestinian Jew living in Jerusalem, right? I mean, he got very very deep roots there. So um, to have the two of you speaking together so forcefully is at least um, uh, some hope for us. Um, yeah, Mark, you got a final statements, and then Jonathan. No, I, I think you said it. <laughs> I think you said it. 
And when I mentioned seminaries, Mark, I said, really, you should go to seminary. And <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, maybe my only for, for final statement is to turn to Jonathan and turn to all of you and say what he said. <laughs> what he said. So we speak, we're saying the same things. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, I I feel we are saying the same thing, although I've never heard uh, it so forcefully put as Mark just put it now. And I don't hear that language, not even from the pro-Palestinian, pro-justice community. They are so afraid to say anything uh, that implies uh, regime change in Israel. Uh, because you say bring us down, and and most uh, Christians would shudder, because they're being required to say uh, that Israel has a right to exist and they have the right to defend itself, and that's the uh, they start from there. Uh, for you to say that the whole thing is 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 uh, corrupt, evil, uh, problematic, bad for Jews as well as for Palestinians. Is, is is a very powerful prophetic statement that that we have not been hearing and I don't know how uh if the church is ever ready for to make such a clear statement but it has to be made the system itself is based on Jewish supremacy and if we're not willing to challenge Jewish supremacy as 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 a as a sin, as an evil thing, as a bad thing, uh, then then we are just uh, nibbling around the edges. Exactly. And uh, and in fact, we are because that's what Israel is counting on: outside support. They cannot do it by themselves. They know they cannot do it by themselves. And in fact, you know, listening to Israeli uh, uh, TV, they didn't expect to be allowed beyond four or five weeks. That's why they ran out of ammunition because they dropped everything they had on Gaza. And and then uh, good old Biden says, here, take some more. Don't worry about it. Use yeah. whatever leverage you want and we'll keep supplying you and we'll give you protection and don't worry about the international community. Don't worry about the UN. Don't worry about the Arab countries. Don't worry about this. Oh, we got your back. Go right. ahead and do it. Yeah. And they're still saying, Go ahead and do it. Yeah. Finish the job. Uh, it, it is horrible, and the church really needs to step up. It has not stepped up. Yes. Yeah, um, and that unfortunately is true. And and um, the, the the final word, uh, except that those on this call um, um, need to respond to it, um, and. Um, Get, get the churches in motion. Thank you again, both. Thank you all for being here. Um, please join us in DC. Um, um, the work goes on. Um, 